And I think it's time for us to get started. You guys know the sound, right? Let's go. Woo! I wanted to do this for a long time. <laughs> oh, welcome, welcome everyone to Thursday I. Today is May 30th. So this year is almost over. Can you believe it? No, just kidding. But it's it's you know, it's end of May. Summer starting. It's exciting. And we have a bunch of stuff to talk about, like a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about, including potentially we're gonna get a few interesting guests. Not that we don't already have a few guests here, so we'll introduce the folks on stage, but we're gonna have a few guests from the actual news this week. And you guys know that one of the the, the things that I like to do the most is introduce the people who are making the news this week. So hopefully, we already have Alignment Lab. He's going to come back soon and talk about Open Chat from earlier this week. But also, we have invited two special guests that I don't see in the audience. They're probably busy, but hopefully, they'll come up. And when they come up, I'm really hoping that they will actually let me know so that I would be able to bring them up. Now, with that introduction, let me just introduce myself super quick. For those of you who are joining, who are new, and for those who need a reminder, my name is Alex Volkov. I'm an AI evangelist with Weights and Biases. Uh, I've been at the company for, I want to say, seven-ish months now. And I am the host of Thursday Eye, the thing you're listening to. Thursday Eye is a Twitter space, a live Twitter space, a weekly live Twitter space that's all about AI news. It's a fairly technical space like Robert Scoble likes to call us. I think he once mentioned for the nerds, which I don't agree. I think it's for everyone. And amazing. Yeah, I just got the confirmation that Rodrigo Lian will join us from Samba Nova. It's going to be a cool conversation as well. However, this space is about AI. We have a very high focus on open source. We love everything open source as much as possible. And we're going to hype and clap to the people who build the open source stuff. Specifically, we have a lot of open source to cover this week. But also, we talk about everything else in AI. So big companies, and we talk about vision and voice. And we're going to have a very interesting conversation about the voice category today. What else is there? Oh, of course, if you're not subscribed to any of... Somebody asked me before if this is now a recorded space on X. No, this one is not recorded. However, once this ends, it's going to happen in maybe a few hours afterwards. I'm going to edit this and I'm going to upload this to the Substack. Can I say Substack or will Elon ban me? I think I can say it. I, just, I can't post it. I can't tweet Substack. Then I'm going to get banned. But there is a Substack and you're not subscribed to it. You're more and more and more than welcome to, along with thousands of other folks, listeners and readers. I write a full newsletter with all the links that we mentioned here as well. So if you're not following anything, Substack is the place. Thursdayi.news, this is the URL, or you just go to just go to my profile. It's probably there. With that, I think here's the introduction. The introduction includes some of the stuff we're going to talk about. This is from Cartesia AI. Let's see if how this sounds and if, if this comes through. This is Cartesia AI. We're going to talk about this, but this specific voice is 1920s Radio Man. And I find it like so, just super cool. I wish I could do the whole show like this. I wish I would talk. And if somebody's building an AI that in real time changes me to this 1920s Radio Man, I would love it. And if somebody builds an AI art thing that actually like does a animation of my face, I would love it as well. And I see some folks in the audience who can actually build this. If you do, don't have to credit me, but come to Thursday to talk about this. Right, folks, I think with that, I will just acknowledge some of the friends here on the panel so far, and we're probably going to get a little bit more guests. Wolfram, welcome to the show. How are you, man? Yeah, thank you. Very busy testing models, so many new releases. Amazing. I, I, I'd love to hear about at least some of the stuff that, that we already going to cover. Hopefully, you saw the, the, the summary stuff. And I also want to welcome Maziar, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Maziar, we've mentioned your work before, but this is your first time on stage, so feel free to unmute and introduce yourself. Hi, Alex. Thanks for having me on your show. Appreciate it. Um, my name is Mazi. You can call me Maz or Mazi, whichever is easier for you. Uh, I'm a research engineer. I work in a French National Center for Scientific Research, doing AI for scientists and researchers. 
Amazing. And so first of all, Nazi, welcome. Second of all, we did mention your name on stage multiple times, I think still to this day, but before even you had multiple models on top of the Hugging Face leaderboard for open source and I believe merges as well and also fine tunes. So we're going to get to chat about this, but also I invited you this week because you participate in the Mistral Hackathon over the weekend that we also co-sponsored in Paris. And I would love to hear from you directly from the person who I think you got second place, right? Uh, yes, there were uh, first place prize, second place prize uh, for fine tuning track and also uh, the use of API track. So we got the second place. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. So I would love to hear about this and what you guys built a little bit maybe later as we go to the show and kind of talk about Weights and Biceps as well because we were there and sponsored. Hopefully you gave the folks high five. I don't know if you caught this, but your name actually appeared in the slides that I helped prepare for the hackathon. That's a little thing. Folks, so I think with this introduction, it's time for the TLDR. Let's do it again. All right, here's the recap. Here's the TLDR, everything we've covered on Thursday I for May 30th. We had a bunch of guests here, uh, folks who have never been here before, and it's super cool. Shout out to Eric Hartford and Rodrigo Liang, the CEO of Samba Nova AI. And we had Arjun as well from Cartesia AI, who joined and talked about the stuff that they released this week. And it was super, super cool. We also had Alignment Labs, our friend Austin, that they released open chat. So those are the guests that we had. But other than that, we've talked about a bunch of stuff. So in the open source, we mentioned Mistral releasing a new open weights model called CodeStroll. CodeStroll is a 22 billion parameter or dense model for coding specifically. It supports fill in the middle capabilities and it's assessed against like other code llama models and deep sea coder, etc. It supports 32,000 context windows. And we've had Itamar from Codium AI who, who, who are building a coding agent actually chime in and talk about how he thinks this model performs and they're testing it with Alpha Codium as well. So shout out to Itamar for joining as well. Ooh, we had a lot of guests this, today. This is awesome. Um, the interesting thing about the code stroll model is that it's a non-production license model the first from mistral previously they used to release everything with apache 2 it's a new license that allows you uh, to use this model via their api called lab platform but not if you host this model directly uh, because we also commented that mistral needs to make money and we need mistral to make money for them to release awesome models going forward additionally with mistral we talked about nvidia open sourcing a new top-of-the-line, state-of-the-art embedding model called NV Embed V1. This embedding model supports like 56 tasks uh, across retrieval, re-ranking, classification, clustering, and uh, scores like a very high 59.36% on the MTB leaderboard benchmark on Hugging Face. That's very, very cool. However, we also talked about the non-practicality of this on productions. We also mentioned the Hugging Face chat, which is a free tool for you to use on web and on your phone. Now added tool use with command R from uh, Cohere. So command R from Cohere is a model we previously mentioned and Hug and Face now added six tasks and tools to the Hug and Face chat. One of them is image generation. One of them is image editing and they're gonna add more and pretty much every Hug and Face space that supports zero GPU initiative that we've mentioned before will be able to get added as a tool which is very 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 cool also mentioned a new contender to the throne of state of the art in sweet bench which is a very hard benchmark consisting of a bunch of i think a thousand github issues and repos and previously sui agent were at the top of the race and then we've talked to the open dev and team before they got like to 25 percent and now open source project called Ader got to the 26 percent mark so beating that by one percent it's super cool specifically because they they use existing features and they don't do anything agentic so it's not an agent thing they don't do rag or vector storage they don't do loops they they do this specifically and they mention we avoid agentic behavior to avoid long delays and reduce high token costs what they do do is actually static code analysis and uh, reliable LM code editing. We also talked with Alignment Lab, our friend of the pod Alignment Lab, about the recent release of OpenChat, which is a series of models at this point. So Meta famously collected 10 million samples by human annotators to give us this amazing instruct model that's very hard to beat in fine tunes. And we also we saw fine tunes fairly slowly beat the instruct version. And now OpenChat with significantly less data set beats the instruct version on multiple benchmarks. In addition, open source news, we mentioned LLM 360 releasing a new model called K2. It's a 65 billion parameter dense model. Uh, and the highlight there is that it comes very close to Llama 370B instruct, 
but it's fully, fully open source. And when I say fully, fully open source, it's not only open weights like we got from Llama. It's uh, the data set is open source. The code to create the data set is open source. The code to run the model and train the model is open source. Checkpoints and, and even analysis available on weights and biases. So they put up a weights and biases link. There you can see how the model was trained and how the benchmarks were run. Everything is in the open source. They did like a hell of a technical report and paper. And shout out to the LLM 360 team because it's very important to the rest of the industry. Then we we switch to talk about big companies and APIs. And here we had a guest, we had two guests, Anton, who's running products for Samba Nova and Rodrigo, who's the CEO and founder of Samba Nova AI, as they had breaking news this week as well, because they have reached and broken through the thousand tokens per second inference speed on Llama 3 in a non-quantized full precision mode. And I think this is going to be really fun <laughs> for, for whatever period of time it goes on, where we keep moving the needle forward and Grout keeps moving the needle forward and GPUs stay still because they nobody can get more out of GPU. So I think I think the first thing that this proves is that the GPU architecture is fundamentally flawed. Thousand tokens per second. Yes, you heard it right. It's just incredible speed on Llama 3B. They were able to do this because they have their own specific hardware called Reconfigurable Data Flow Unit, RDUs. And Rodrigo told us all about those RDUs. So if you're interested for that conversation, definitely give a, give this a listen. It's 100% uh, Samanova hardware. This is our fourth generation chip. It's called RDU, a Reconfigurable Data Flow Unit. And this is ultimately where, where I think you're going to see the world go, that the efficiencies are not 10 to 20%. You're seeing efficiencies of 4, 5, 10x. And specifically, we talked about different uh, architectures like SSMs and how their architecture, the non-GPU architecture, is benefiting more from kind of some of those architectures. In response to Samba Nova achieving this score, Grok also hits back and released another breaking, breaking benchmark of 1,200 tokens per second Llama 3. And I think it's very interesting because both of them are competing on this Llama 3 8B, so the smaller Llama 3. However, we all know that Llama 3 400B is coming up and those very fast inference speed are going to be very important when this like huge model drops. We then had a discussion about scale AI. They released something called SEAL leaderboards. And we had a whole discussion as we talked about evaluations where LMC Serena, the, the darling of the kind of industry so far about understanding how models work, is just one approach, which is a human uh, ELO score based approach. We also talked about the fact that open source benchmarks like GSM 8K could potentially already leak into these models as they train. Scale announced a new leaderboard where the evaluations that they have, the data set that they have to evaluate these models is private. It's not released. Models are, are which? And we saw, for example, a difference with GPT-4.0, where it was very, very hyped and, and very high up on the LMC's leaderboards. And it's still very high up, but it's not beating GPT-4 Turbo, for example. We then, specifically after scale, we talked about how Gemini 1.5 Pro and Gemini 1.5 Flash are topping the leaderboards. And specifically, I got very excited about Gemini Flash because of its price point. We then had breaking news from Logan Kilpatrick, the product of a Google AI Studio that told us that not only that uh, these models are generally available today, literally happened during the space, they also, Gemini Flash now has a thousand requests per minute limit. So a thousand RPM, that's huge for multiple tasks. Uh, and that they've announced a new uh, tuning support. You can fine tune Gemini 1.5 Flash and the fine tuning and the model fine tuned version inference will cost you the same. So fine tuning is free and uh, running this model inference after after you fine tuned is also it costs the same as the base model, which is very unique proposition. We then also mentioned that OpenAI added GPT-40, web search, vision, code interpreter, and more to free users. And also the rumored OpenAI partnership with Apple, that supposedly in WWDC, we're going to have a new Siri powered potentially by OpenAI, and how there's rumors that this complicates OpenAI and Microsoft's relationship, whether or not Microsoft will be able to actually handle all those Apple users. This week's bus category, I talked about the Paris Hackathon with Mistral, the week on sponsored. Also, I mentioned that we have an upcoming workshop that's called Let's Get Better Step-by-Step, Step, LLMs in Your Business, that's running in two parts. That's from Weights and Biases for free for you. Please feel free to check out 
the show notes for that. We've had an announcement from Cartesia.ai, and we had Ar Arjun Desai, the co-founder for Cartesia. Uh, Cartesia.ai is a new text-to-speech, very high-quality, very uh, fast text-to-speech service that's based on state space models, something we've talked about as a alternative to transformer-based architecture. And we, did, we talked about how this leads them to get a blazing fast inference under 135 milliseconds latency, which is just blink of an eye. You press a button, it just like immediately starts talking. Very, very impressive. A lot of the work that we were doing here at Cartesia is built off some of the research that our co-founders did, uh, Albert Gu and Kern Goyle um, did during their PhD at Stanford, uh, which is really focusing on uh, efficient architectures. Uh, so a lot of times right now, a lot of the ML world is focused on transformers and attention. Uh, they really spent time on focusing on how you can build these next generation of sub-quadratic models, specifically state-space models. Very impressive. Great conversation. Thank you, Arjun, for joining. And shout out to Cartesia AI for this like impressive speed. And I guess we'll get started with open source. Let's go. Open source AI, let's get it started. Open source AI, let's get it started. And this is our favorite corner. This is the, the the focus of the space, I would say. Like open source is what we're here to talk about. And I think with that, I see Alignment Labs, Alignment Lab, I'm sorry. Alignment Lab, his name is, can we say the name? Is that cool? Or no, we're not going to duck. Yeah. My name's Austin. Hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ducks, <laughs> Ducks himself. Hey, Austin, welcome to the stage, buddy. You haven't been here for a minute. And uh, there's a bunch of exciting news. Let's start with Open Chat, and then you, you'd be able to just chime in on other stuff. But I would love for you to just announce Open Chat, because Open Chat has been around for a minute. Uh, what's new in the Open Chat world? Yeah, it's yeah, Open Chat has been around for a minute, isn't it? It's really early on. It's one, the, the developer who really works on that and pays the most attention to it was. I think he's been going on in that one for a few months now. They built this giant data set. It was all like synthetic preference data, which is nice because it means you don't need to get people involved to make it. And they outperformed Llama Instruct by a pretty decent margin, I think, with, with no human data, which I thought was really interesting. The model seems all right. I've used it personally quite a bit, and I've been enjoying it. It's really good to, for workflows where you actually need someone to follow instructions with a high degree of understanding what you're saying. It's cool. It's nice that it's still paying dividends, this technique of CRLFT, where we're having this sort of DPO type method that just doesn't require us to make like explicit pairs for good and bad on the examples. We can just take normal data and label it and train on it. Uh, overall, yeah, it's still cooking too. They're already like working on the next one. And it's sitting on a bunch of just H100s right now, I think. So I'm really hoping for a demo to easy, easily to run this. Mm -hmm. How do folks run this right now? Yeah, so you can actually just go to the website .team, I think, is the URL. And it's that same thing as what the demo was that I mentioned in the announcement posts on the GitHub repo for OpenChat. It's also in the announcement post. Oh, And it's well, right well, in the description. It's just, yeah, it's chatbot UI with a nice inference engine behind it. All right. And it looks like you don't even have to log in. Cool. So, folks, go to openchat.team. We'll add this to the show notes as well. I'm actually going to add this right now. Yeah, just wanted to say it's a transformer model like all the others, so you can just run it as you usually do as well. And there are even GTUFs as far as I've seen. Nothing special. You can use the open chat, but you can just use a normal transformer version from Hugging Face, for example. Oh, amazing. Okay. And probably using the same tools that we know and love, like LM Studio and Llama.cpp. Yeah, sure. Yes. Probably a lot of LM Studio. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us about Open Chat and also working on, on this. Shout out to Alpi Ariak as well, who's working on this. And I guess the other guy is Open Chat Dev. This is the, the nickname. Uh, so shout out to them. I tried to get Alpi here and we always miss each other. He was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see this. I was busy cooking. So thank you for coming up and talking about Open Chat. Folks, uh, give Open Chat a try. Uh, the you guys claim state of the art specifically you Austin, thank you feel free to stick around and kind of chime in on the other stuff because the next stuff is i think we're going to talk about the llm 360 releasing a new model a fully transparent reproducible everything end-to-end -end open source called k2 65 billion it it's coming from this organization k2 that we've never mentioned before i don't believe on the show otherwise i would remember we did mention though olmo from 
Allen Institute for AI, and Olmo is on the same thing. These guys actually thanked Olmo as well. They also released Olmo and open sourced everything. And, and the focus there was, hey, we train the model. It doesn't have to be state of the art, even though I must admit, I'm, I'm focused on giving you the state of the art ones. But I think it's very important to highlight the efforts of releasing everything. And by everything, I mean stuff like code for the actual training of the model, but also code to generate the data set, the data set itself, the checkpoints, right? So as the model trains, there's multiple checkpoints that people can decide, you know what, the model is actually done. So they release like multiple checkpoints along the, 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 the building uh, of the model, which really helps many other folks and researchers to like figure out like what went wrong and kind of like continue pre-training from a specific thing. And they released all the research, so a technical paper and even even released a weights and biases thing weights and biases and biases thing like a link to their weights and biases dashboard where you can see the model actually train which is of course they use weights and biases because what else would they use weights and biases is is the thing that people should use while they train models and so shout out to the k2 thing folks i will go and just find this tweet super quick for you to pin this to the top of the space any comments here from the stage austin i want to hear from you about k2 and their efforts of open sourcing everything yeah, I think we did actually talk about it one time, like quite a while ago. We talked about uh, Amber. We were discussing like LLMC or LLM 360s mm. stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's, you uh, may be it's right. Cool. You may be right. We talk about a lot of stuff, so maybe yes, but we definitely mentioned them at least once. It was quite brief, but yeah, I think it's dope. I think open source everything. Let everyone see exactly what you're doing. It's not really a moat, anyways, to know how to do it because no one wants to do it anyways. And like, it just makes everything go way faster and it keeps everyone on the same page. Cause like right now the asymmetry of information is very high and uh, it's noisy space. Absolutely. And so we really appreciate them and give this model a try as well. They're again, they're competing with, so it's 65 billion parameters model. They open sourced everything in their, in their announcement images, they did average of all evals on coding, on math. They didn't specify specific ones like human eval or MMLU, etc. They did do it in the weights and biases. So you can actually go to the dashboard. Let me, how can I share a screenshot of this with you? Because it looks super cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll just do a screenshot here and paste it in the comments and put it up on here. So if you guys will give me a sec. I'm trying to operate the space while I'm talking. It's very interesting. But here's a screenshot, K2 dashboard and it looks super super cool like every what's the message dashboard and then it's in the comments let's see if i can put it up on stage for you i specifically love just to explore the, the live dashboard and uh, they have all the metrics there so they have the hello swag and arc challenge and we know ground and gsm 8k like all of these all of these mmlu as well they, they have all of these um, evaluations running as as they train the model i'm assuming and so they show like all of the train runs it's just like Awesome to see how, how the sausage is made from, from like very important labs, but also the whole, I guess, the whole process is open source, which I, I really love. So shout out to K2 folks. Anything else from folks on stage? Mazir, have you seen the K2 stuff? Have you had the chance to take a look at them? What do, what do you think about generally like open sourcing everything like this? Does it help you in your work? Uh, I I love it. It, it. The transparency and the way you can reproduce everything is very important, especially in AI research. And don't hold me to it, but I already downloaded it and I started fine tuning it. I think it's, it's already better than Lama 2 because it's, it has five, I think five, six billion less parameters. So it's already you can see on the VRAM and the speed. Uh, I'll see how it goes by the end of tonight, but I'm really excited. Uh, I think we should really uh, give a shout out to them by releasing and open sourcing everything. I think it's, it should be not on, don't undermine them because they may be a little bit less than Lama 3. That was not the point. I think the point is to really releasing everything, which is incredible in my, in my, my opinion. Absolutely. And I think this is the space to do it as well. I wish I reached out to the folks at LLM360. Uh, if you guys know them, please uh, connect me to anyone there. I would love to highlight their work and bring them to the stage and talk about how, how important open source is. Last time the OMO was released, we had uh, Nathan from the, the Allen Institute for AI talk about this as well. It inches closer to Llama 3, but I don't think that's the point. The point is it's a fully open source. Like we don't know, the data sets were not open sourced by Meta. And although we love Meta for the release of Llama 3 and shout out to Joe Spizak, the team, everybody who works on Meta, it wasn't fully, fully open source. So it, it helps people, but this 
from a smaller team, significantly less funded team, because we know how much uh, GPUs Meta have, it's very impressive. It gets, on their average of all evals, Llama 3 Instruct gets a 63% average, and their K2 chat gets 59.5. So very, very close performance with 5 billion less parameters, and I'm assuming at least a few billion less funding for the company, because again, this came from Meta. So... I think, so shout out to LLM360. And again, if somebody knows them in the audience, oh, they're listening, please talk to me. I would love to feature in chat with you about this effort. And it's awesome. Also in the open source, let's talk about Mistral, open weights, uh, releasing code stroll. So Mistral, the, the folks, if you listen to Thursday, I, you know who Mistral is. I, I don't need to repeat. And you also know, we, we talked about Mistral pretty much every week, I would say. And this model or this release, I struggled to open, to, to put in this open source LLM. Oh, we got breaking news from Entropic just now. Oh, super cool. I'll, I'll mention this in a second. Uh, but uh, M Mistral has released this code stroll with open weights. They mentioned open weights. And not only they mentioned open weights, they released a new license as well. So let's first of all talk about what code stroll is. Uh, code stroll is their coding focused model that's trained on, I think, like something like 80 languages. It has a 32K context window. Uh, and and uh, they compare it to like smaller length, context length for competitors, even though we know there's a few other ones. Uh, they say they outperform all other models on repo bench, long range eval for code generation. I have personally never heard of a repo bench, but I will start taking a look. I know that Sweet Bench is the one that I'm like focused on and know that's like very hard. Um, However, we know uh, at this point that human eval, human eval is a, a benchmark that OpenAI released a long time ago. I think it's 100 Python questions. We know that human eval is not a great evaluator because it probably leaked to ma many, many models already overfitted on that benchmark. And we're going to mention this in the next section as well and, and the, the ways to fix this. CodeStroll also has fill in the middle abilities. So fill in the middle, unlike code completion, fill in the middle is... You give it a chunk of code and it will be able to actually write the code in the middle of it. It's very important for code. Actually, I see Itamar. Itamar, would you like to come up and talk about code stroll at some point? Uh, you feel free to come up and send you an invite. Fill in the middle is very important for uh, the ability to like assess and, and, and actually give you very helpful code instructions. And they released it with the support in VS Code via plugins already. So you can already use this. Now, here's the next thing. And maybe before, I want to see if anybody on the stage has comments about Coastro at this point. I have tried it. And if not, I will talk about the next thing, which is the the new license. Hey, do you hear me well enough? I hope it's okay. Oh, Itamar, hey, welcome. I don't believe that you've been on Thursday Eye before. I think I've been on your spaces and we've talked in other places, right? So if you haven't been here, please introduce yourself <laughs> briefly to the audience. Sure thing. Itamar Friedman, the CEO and co-founder of uh, Coding AI. Uh, if you're aware of our tools, we have plenty of them. The re recent one we released last week was Cover Agent, which is basically a reproduction, re-implementation of a test gen LLM by Meta. They didn't open, they didn't publish open source. And we have a bunch of other, the PR agent, the code mate, et cetera. And we did uh, start playing with Codestral and so far we are impressed, but we need to run it on our benchmarks. Uh, one of our benchmarks is uh, Alpha Codium. It's an open source tool that we released that basically uh, competes with Alpha Code by DeepMind and GPT-4, etc. Uh, it also uses GPT-4, but competes against uh, OpenAI submission on a benchmark that is called Code Contest. It's a, it's a benchmark data set that collected by DeepMind and, and Alpha Codium uh, competes on that and makes it easier to to try it. Basically, every time we see a new model, we try it first on Alpha Codium because it's a really hard benchmark. It's, it's like the best model performs the 30% accuracy on the past five. And with, even with a system like Alpha Codium, usually a past five with no more than 100 calls to a model per problem is, doesn't pass the 50%. So it's a really hard programming task. So we will probably like try it on on the cold stroll and then and, and publish results. But but further than that, I don't have too much to to, to add because uh, we're still experimenting with it. Could you, thank you, for, first of all, thank you. Second of all, I would love to hear from you the importance of fill in the middle abilities versus just auto completion. Okay, Could cool. you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll keep it simple again, and, and please dig again, like uh, as you wish. I, I think that basically the the way we organize context matter. <laughs> Supposedly, you can try to generalize fill in the middle by adding the 
the second part after the the middle uh, to the beginning of the context and 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 saying please uh, include this first part and second part and try to fiddle in the middle but but basically if you train a model for specifically for that then it's probably like what we see performs better faster for, for this use case so fill, fill in the middle like it's uh, as, as as simple as to, to understand is like if you're for example you're doing code completion and and you, you, you want to try to fill something in the context to fill some piece of code in the middle of a, of a function or, or a class and the context beneath and, and, and above, they both, both, both exist. I hope I understood you correctly. Or, yeah, yeah, you're, or you're spot on right. Uh, so let me just rephrase maybe from what I understand. It's the ability of the model to take into account, into the context, like not only what code came before it and then autocomplete from, from the rest of it, but also the other functions uh, above. So like in bigger context, I think it's very important, right? So you can like shove... A lot yeah. more context, and then the 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 model can place the code in the middle and call the functions that go yeah. after it. You know what? You know what? Maybe I, ha I do have something interesting to say there. I think one thing that I, I'm not sure it's well yet understood. And by the way, please take with a grain of salt. There's a lot of experience we're having at Codium AI, and 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 maybe people see things differently. Is that this, despite the fact that there is amazing gen uh, gen general use of models like GPT-4.0 and and etc. Still taking taking a model and fine tuning it for a specific task could could perform really well. And I can tell you that in even some cases even outperform even the best generic models. So it's it's not don't underestimate the power of of fine tuning for a specific task. And then one can claim that the fill in the middle is is a kind of a specific task. So although it's like a bit more generic one and and, and that's why it's maybe a bit more surprising that that it's, it's important but but it's still there. There is evidence that fine tuning and, and training for a specific uh, way, way of use, uh, a specific task, is, could, could, the, the model can actually perform better. Better. Yeah, and that's why we. I think we. That's why we see Code Llama get released from from Meta, and then we see Code Stroll now from from these folks, and we've seen other like very well performing like Dipsy Coder, etc. Released as well. Itamar, thank you so much, and feel free to stay stay and kind of chime in on some other stuff. But folks, definitely check out Code <laughs> and Itamar's work, especially around like flow engineering. You have uh, exciting stuff that folks need to need to learn, and I probably also need to learn as well. So maybe we'll bring you at some point and talk about flow engineering and the different uh, efforts you're you're doing at Codium. Sure. sure. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, I love to. <laughs> I love to. Let me know. Like, uh, I was surprised seeing this live right now on my phone, and I and I uh, jo immediately join. I love to think about it up front. And yeah, the, the, the codium is the C O D I U uh, M A I. Yeah. Yeah. So give it a follow and 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 give uh, codium a try as well. I want to welcome Nistin to the stage. Hey, Nistin, welcome. Thoughts on code stroll super quick before we move on and talk about some other stuff. I, I almost missed the space because of it. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, I like it better than Gemini Pro. And I found some other strange stuff. Like if you, if you warm it up as a, as a conversation, because I accidentally plugged it into other, other things that I had, then it continued on with a, a very different personality that it, it was actually following the prompts and the instructions and it, it could do storytelling which i found interesting because normally it doesn't do that it, it just says it's pretty it's pretty rlhf or deep policy optimized or, or whatever it is to just say hey i'm just a coding ai i cannot do that but if you if you warm it up with the with the conversation and in fact it can do that it, it has more capabilities as as a model otherwise yeah, all right. More looking at. But thankfully, you did not miss uh, the space. And but yeah, code stroll. And let's talk about the license super quick. Unlike anything else before, uh, Mistral released this model in a non-commercial R&D only kind of thing, right? If you are using this model downloadable, if you download the models and actually run and host it yourself, you are not able to make money out of this. This is the first thing that Mistral released in this way. Previously, they just released like newer models via their API platform called La Platform. I don't know how to pronounce, I'm not French, but that's, I think, <laughs> how it's called. And now they actually released the model, they released the weights, they called it open weights and not open source because like we assume the open source is going to be also with an open source license and they released a new license called mistral ai non-production license or mnpl uh, mnpl actually tells you that if you read the license it's not that complex it actually tells you that you are not able to use this in a commercial setting and also that mistral is not liable on the outputs of whatever this model outputs i think it's very important we had a conversation about this in another space from the intel ai folks about 
should there be another license? Why not release this in like an existing license like GPL? And I think it's like a very, maybe Mistral takes the first step here into writing a license specifically for for models because models are not only code, they're not only weights, there's also who's in charge of the outputs and, and the inference, etc. So it's very interesting to see that they have a very specific license. With that said, when other companies release models in open weights with like restrictive license, it remains to be seen how enforceable this is. So that I'm um, not legal advice, but it remains to be very like, uh, I, I don't think this license has been tested in court because they literally just came out. But that I don't think is the point. The point is Mistral is trying to make money. And so far, like many, 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 many companies did build on Mistral stuff so far. All of the stuff they released with Apache 2 and started hosting Mistral models in all the inference engines, etc. And now Mistral is saying, hey, we are open sourcing stuff, but we also need to make money. We're here. Our evaluation is, I don't remember, I think they're like 6 billion or something. We need to make money. This is their first attempt. So this model is now available via the API and the Let Chat platform where you can just chat with this, but also you can download the weights, but you cannot put them on production yourself without uh, breaking the license. I think you need to talk with Mistral. Yeah, and uh, MNPL license. Anything to add here on the license, folks, jump in. And if not, we'll move on. Oh, there's one other thing to add here, but yeah, license conversation. I, I looked at the license more by just like pasting it into, into a bunch of bots. And it, it does not prevent you from shipping a software that then downloads the model and then the user just runs it on their own. You just cannot host inference and, and serve it that way. It doesn't really hurt people that are making like apps that, that are selling apps to people. So you can still sell an app and then the app downloads it and runs it on their own. You just cannot serve the inference from your own servers and, and charge Ooh. for that. That's interesting. So, That's interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. So you're so saying I, I can think... bundle technically this thing and sell the app itself. And if the app downloads the, the, the code, then it's cool. <laughs> yeah, you can sell a UI for it. Uh, because again, it's going to be interoperable with other models too. Yeah. It it doesn't prevent you that much in that regard. But again, they do need to make money and that's they're, they're going that's more to prevent enterprise and stuff. Yeah. Because that that's where they're looking for for profits. Yep. All right. And the last thing that we didn't mention about this is that Mistral conveniently, conveniently didn't mention another very good coding model that beats this on pretty much all the metrics. It's a 7B model called CodeQuen, and it lo it has Instruct and has fill in the middle as well. It has 87 on human eval, which again, we said that human eval is not that great of a metric and potentially this was leaked into the data set of, of code Quen. But we will be remiss if we don't mention our friends from Alibaba who work on Quen, uh, Jun Yang Ling, often a co-host of the space. And definitely we'll be remiss if we don't at least mention that there is a model with 64K contact window. Itamar, do you have any experience with code Quen for you guys? Yeah, first of all, so hello to the Alibaba dudes. And I admit that I'm not objective. I worked in Alibaba for years. <laughs> oh, okay, good. And, but I, I hope that what I'm going to share next is objective that I can tell you that CodeCoin, we are impressed from it and from a few perspective. And one of them, one of the aspects is that it fine-tunes really well. I know, again, it might sound surprising, but not all models are fine-tuned equally. And CodeCoin fine-tunes really well. And and I also would take a look on, on, on DeepSeek and also a very good code model. And and one more thing is that about the license, I think that uh, although there's, it's quite new, new for the code like models, actually, if you look on the vision models, you will find this type of uh, business model. And for example, if BriAI, they, they released a vision uh, model for generating images, et cetera, and it has a similar business model with uh, licensing and, and it works really well at just recently being introduced in Azure and, and Bedrock, I think, and others. I, I think I agree with you. It's going to be a lot towards this, this direction. And, and in my opinion, the company that is going to release something similar to Coastal, but that they will give some assurance that it was trained only on permissive data, I think that will work really well. And, and that, that will be a very, very good business model.
Absolutely. And we, we do know that like folks like Stability AI, for example, they tried some of this licensing. Stability famously did not succeed in kind of that membership and the rumors that looking for sale as well. Mistral, hopefully it works out for them. We want more Mistrals. We want companies that open source, but also are making money enough such that VCs and whatever, they're, they're continuing uh, f- funding those companies. So shout out to Mistral for uh, Code Stroll, even though the Code Quen is, is probably, at least on me- metrics, is at least as performant and they conveniently forgot to mention this in the comparisons. It's fine, uh, but shout out to Mistral for this release. Absolutely. And we really hope that folks use this via their API. And let's move on super quick because we've been at this for a minute and then we have a bunch of other stuff to mention. The next thing I want to talk about, actually, it's amazing that you're here because a lot of stuff that we talk about now are code related. We've talked about SWE Bench before. SWE Bench is a metric that's also a hard metric that has been around from Princeton. No, but it, it, it's been around for some time. I think it's yeah. about a thousand somewhat easy uh, GitHub tickets that... You, you have to solve on it. it it's funny enough that you mentioned you guys mentioned it because i just saw there's a good there's an open devin fine-tune of of code Quen that just came out oh interesting gonna make some ggufs of, of that yeah i'm gonna try it out because it's uh, it's made specifically for moving around in the system so oh, it's yeah, from princeton language and intelligence group pli group and so sweet bench is like also a hard benchmark for models because it requires like multiple steps and it's it's harder and so we we specifically mentioned sweet bench because devin when it released it broke the bubble kind of that ai bubble on x and many other folks who didn't hear about any of the other stuff we talked about because they don't listen to Thursday I they did mention Devin so Devin definitely was like a very popular thing and Devin reported like a, a score on sweet bench it was like I think 13.8 compared to just regular cloud 2 was 4% and GPT-4 was 1.7% or something and so since then we've seen this, this rise in open source on, on sweet bench scores and this week we have another state of the art from from something called Aiden Ader sorry Ader Ader is a again open source like non-agent specifically they mentioned that their their non-agent behavior like runner it doesn't use rag it doesn't use vector search it doesn't use tools it doesn't use access to the web etc and they do unilateral code execution they do static code analysis and they they have what something they call programmatic ux for ai pair programming so either got to 26 percent which is i think is the highest sweet bench score that we've seen around and i think i'm focused on that specifically because i think it's very interesting it looks like we lost which is fine thank you Tamar, for joining us i haven't actually tried either but i will add this to the show notes as well so if you guys want to give it a try i think it's very interesting because they build a how should i say they build like a tree of the repository and like running to the tree in an efficient way and they're getting like very impressive results with no rag and uh no agentic behavior. They specifically mentioned they don't use any agentic stuff to avoid long delays and reduce high token costs. And you know that agent is running LLMs in loop and uh, agentic stuff usually, it sounds very exciting at first. And then you look at your GPT-4 bill and you're like, oh, uh, that was expensive because again, it runs in loop. They have a very interesting new approach and shout out to the Ader team. Anybody here tried Ader and wanted to mention anything around Ader or that approach specifically? I think that the last thing that I want to mention, so with that, the last two things I want to talk about in open source, first of all, is a new embedding model from NVIDIA. NVIDIA releases models. That's super cool. So if you guys remember, there is a leaderboard called MTB leaderboard on Hugging Face, the massive embedding model leaderboard, I think it's called. And we've had folks from Gina AI, if you go, if you guys remember Bo and some other folks who are like very, very focused on embedding models specifically, they said that that MTB leaderboard is not like the best because at, at, at this point, most of the models have the data set were leaked and most of the models are probably already contaminated. However, it's still a place to, to go and see embedding models. If you don't want to use the ones that OpenAI provides for you or other resources, you want to host your embedding model yourself, maybe fine tune the embedding model. MTB is like a good place to start. And on the MTB leaderboard now, on the it's a benchmark on the leaderboard, we have a new contender. It's called NV Embed V1. So this is like from new from NVIDIA. A, it's a, a it's a collection of models, I believe. It has it supports 56 tasks like in retrieval, re-ranking, classification, clustering, semantic, textual, similarity tasks. And they get a high score of 59 on the 15 retrieval tasks within this benchmark. So this benchmark is not only about embedding, it's also about retrieval and some other things like this. Super cool and great to see some open source from NVIDIA. Here's some stuff about this. It's 
Decoder only LLM, it's based on Mistral 7B V0.1. So not even the 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Just the base 0 0.1 from nine months ago, 10 months ago. I think it was September. Yes, and so it's embedding dimensions, 4,000 embedding dimensions and 32 sequence length, 32,000 sequence length input. Here's the thing about topping the MTB and this, we, we talked about this before, so would love to hear your thoughts about this as well. Wolfram, feel free to chime in. I don't know. Actually, Mazi, you're welcome to chime in as well on embeddings. Building embedding models that are based on Mistral, it's a no, non-starter for hosting them yourself. The whole point of embedding models, usually for RAG purposes, is to super quickly embed the user query and you maybe don't want to host like a 7 billion parameter model to just do embeddings, even though it's probably the best embeddings around. The embeddings model are usually like tiny as well, like in terms of like just running them super quick as well. So while this is academically super cool, beating beating the leaderboard for MTB, I don't think, and last we've talked about this, we didn't arrive at a conclusion, but I don't think necessarily that this is a like a very good like production ready system. What do you guys think? Even though it beats this uh, course. It's not. Uh, as you say, it's really great to see how far we can go and why we go that far, but it's not ready for production. We often do vectorize millions of papers. Like last time, there's a new embedding. Let's try to put 33 million abstracts and titles of PubMed into Elasticsearch to see where we go with this. It, it takes a long amount of time. Uh, even though we distribute it over a Spark, we have a big cluster of Kubernetes, a lot of CPUs but we're never gonna go for anything above 200, 300 million parameters because we want to be on a commodity CPUs. We want to be, we want to be done with it in a day and we want it to be quick, 7 billion required GPUs. It's not gonna be production ready, but it's great research. It, it shows how far we can go and why you can go that far. Maybe the parameters do matter. Maybe the context length do matter. Uh, I'm excited to see that, but it's not going to be used in production for sure. Yeah, so it's great for research. And also the the license is CC by NC. It's a non-commercial license from NVIDIA, but it's super cool to see the state of the art topping the leaderboard. Nisna, go ahead. And then we have two breaking news that we need to talk about. Yeah, also what most don't realize is that you can just do embeddings with, with any model. You can also pick Phi for embeddings. You can use Llama CPP. In fact, some, some people do do use it and uh, yeah I, I i don't i don't know why embedding models are launched also in float 32 and then they run extra slow because they're they're in 32 bit i i think just not enough people mess around with them to to make them faster but yeah you don't necessarily need a, a, a bespoke embedding model you can actually just use any model to to do embeddings with yeah yeah, I I know for a fact that like you can fine tune for different tasks as well, like like retrieval and re ranking, like lo those things are getting used. And uh, once you do this, actual like better performance on some tasks, uh, and maybe that's like the, the fine tuning of Mistral. That's what helps this model to beat like the state of the art. Moving on, let's do and super quickly. I think Wolfram, you you sent this, so I'll, I'll give you the, the the breaking news. AI breaking news <laughs> coming at you only on Thursday I. Awesome. Uh, Wolfram, you want to take this one because you sent it uh, from IEIT. It's a tiny new model with a very impressive score. Okay, I just saw it as well. It's from UN2 UN M32 is uh, from IE. IT UN. I don't know them. Sounds Chinese, maybe? Yeah, we, we never um, mentioned anyway, them before. Yeah. It's a 40B mixture of experts model, and the big thing about it is that it is only 3.7B active parameters. It's like a small phi model in that regard, but it's uh, achieved a really high score. So it's something to look at and check out and see if it may have been contaminated or maybe not. But it's MMLU, and it's one of the better benchmarks, I say. So having a big score there is, yeah, it's impressive with that small parameter. So if it is not contaminated, that is a model to really take a look at. Absolutely. And you 72.2 uh, with not that many parameters, like 3.7 active parameters. Active parameters is the score, like for folks who don't follow this as closely as we are, when you have a mixture of experts model, uh, only a few experts activate at, at, at the forward pass or as like the model tries to figure out the 
the the next token to predict basically and then that's when when folks are releasing mm sorry mixture of experts model they like to talk about the number of active parameters although running this locally you still need enough RAM to run the whole model as well but yeah they like to mention like the number of active parameters 3.7 active parameters is very low as well Mazi, go ahead you have unmuted i think as well no okay wolfram please go ahead yeah, so it's 32 experts and two are active and it has 8K context, which is not much, especially for a small model, we could use much more. So that's a little disappointing, but at least it's not less than Llama 3. And it's Apache 2.0, 2.0 license. So it's a free open source license that is also very, very good. And they claim that it outperforms Mixtral 8 times 7 b on all benchmarks and gets close to Llama 3. 370B, which is amazing for such a small model. So I will definitely test it and see if it works that well for me too. Nissan, go ahead. Yeah, the the one thing that these kinds of architectures with a, a lot of experts and very few active are, are, are good for is for running it on, on the CPU. You should be able to get very good CPU speeds with this on on any older system because you're you're just running a a 3B model so so you should be able to get like very usable speed out of this and uh, CPU RAM is cheap so I I, I like this. I, yeah, amazing! Shout out to the folks at I think the model is called Yuan Two. 32 uh, MOE with 32, I guess, m experts and IET Yuan uh, released. Okay, so on Hugging Face and uh, with a nice license as well, because why not? And let's see how far fine tuning can take this. All right, folks, I think this is it for the open source stuff. Let me see. No, last thing, last thing I want to talk about super quick is Hugging Face Chat. If you guys haven't tried Hugging Face Chat, it's there for you and super cool. Yeah, they have a bunch of like different models. Let me see what actual models they have uh, that you can play with. Not only that, Nistin, and you mentioned this like a couple of times before the app the ios app they have is actually like super cool and if you want to pull up one of these models and just a chat with it the ios app is like definitely definitely dope they have uh llama 370b instructed in there they have zephyr orpo they have the mixtral and new Cermes mixtrals and they have yi as well and Gemma. they have a bunch of ones and recently they've added one other model that we've talked about before from cohere it's called command r plus and command r plus is like very specific uh, because it's it's it has use of tools and we've talked about like this its ability of using tools as well and now hugging face actually added into their interface into the ability the ability of this model to actually use these tools and it's super cool they have web search so now they i actually don't know what backs their web search maybe google maybe bing well we'll see i don't think they mentioned this if you guys know they just mentioned it's an internal tool but also they have stuff like a document parser, which you can upload the document and it will parse it for you. And it uses the new initiative called Zero GPU Space, which we mentioned last week, where Hagen Face is committing like $10 million quote. I am not getting paid by Hagen Face to say this. I'm just like really excited about the company and their offering and what they do for the community. Zero GPU is super, super cool. And the document parser, the image generation abilities. So I think they're running like different stable diffusion stuff behind. So you can ask the chat, hey, generate an image. You know how you can do this with DALI in inside GPT-4, et cetera. So Hug and Face Chat in the open source, using open source models can now do this. So they're connecting a text model, uh, command R plus to another model as well. And uh, you're now able to run uh, those tasks. They also have image editing. And I don't know if uh, if uh, Lino is still around. And I saw Lino before in the audience. I think they're using Ledits uh, from, from other folks in Hug and Face. And that is super cool. You can upload an image and you can literally ask it to, uh, you can literally ask it to generate something for you and and change the image so i uploaded an image of of yan lekun because as, as one must when these models are around and ask it for a mustache and added the mustache as well so hug and face chat with with tools is very very cool they also have a calculator because th these models can't really calculate anything so that is i think the last thing in our open source stuff before we move to bigger companies and apis nistan i know you love hug and face chat you used it a while you shouted out their new ios app have you tried some of the some of these tools no, but I love sending it to people that don't normally use LLMs or wouldn't even install LM Studio. And whenever they need something, I, I just make them an agent with Llama 370B or actually the, the big, big stroll is also pretty good for, for new people 
I, I found. And yeah, you just dump in a very long system prompt and you even have rag in there. It, it's actually pretty amazing, especially if you configure it with, with your own sources. Uh, yeah, had someone wanted a certain chord in, in a certain state, and, and then I just gave it that persona and gave it the a place to find the laws for that state. It actually was working very well. Yeah, uh, yeah, people are underusing that. Yep, absolutely. And we need to highlight the fact that it's fully free, even though OpenAI also released some free stuff, th 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 which we're going to cover in the next section. It's fully free and other tools will be used. They outline specifically how they choose tools and you can suggest other tools in the community discussion. They must use the zero GPU initiative uh, from Hugging Face. They, they need to reply with 20 seconds uh, to ensure a good experience. And it's really awesome to see something that previously was only in the realm of GPT-4.0 with tools now in the fully in the open source using kind of command R as the model and super cool so shout out to Kahir and Hug and Face for this collab and if you are into this go build tools for this Hug and Face chat now awesome so now I think it's time to reset the space we've been here for uh, almost an hour we're moving into the 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 next section we have a, a, a guest here yeah Rodrigo welcome okay. to right, to Thursday I this is your first time here and you guys have a bunch of breaking news this week that I really am excited to talk to you about as well uh, could you please uh, introduce yourself and who you are and what someone knows is yeah, thanks for having me. So Rodrigo Leong, co-founder and CEO of Samba Nova Systems. We're a platform company, and so we build hardware to the trillion parameter model called Samba One. So our hardware competes with NVIDIA on training, fine-tuning, and inferencing, and we focus on production, production AI for large enterprises. And so we roll in our hardware full stack. We preload a trillion parameter model that is that is based off of open source based models, and then we deliver that to uh, to large enterprises so that they can fine tune their private data into those models and then run it privately. So imagine this basically similar to running your own private GPT if you have data that you don't want to disclose and we can fine tune it into these different open source models and then run it at run it in your own secure environment. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, how long have you guys been uh, around for? Because I think we mentioned uh, the previous release you did, but I don't remember I was talking about uh, someone over too much. How long have you guys been around? Yeah, I, I co-founded the first three years of the company. We raised 1.1 billion in venture capital. We're the best funded AI startup, chip startup in the in the world. And the investors include Google Ventures, Intel Capital, Samsung, BlackRock, Masasan, and SoftBank did my last round, a $678 million round back in 2021. And that was including Temasek and GIC. And so a lot of really, really great investors. And, and I've been around since 2017. Amazing. And this week, and thank you so much for coming up. I will be remiss if I don't mention that you and the CEO of Weights and Biases had a chat on the Gradient Descent podcast. So if you folks want to hear more from Rodrigo, please check out the Gradient Descent episode that you guys recently released, right? But this week, this week, you guys came out with some exciting news that I saw and they really on Thursday I that this is the show. I love to talk about the folks who make the news. This week you guys broke the barrier of a thousand tokens per second on Llama. Could you could you tell us about this? Because that's insane. I really want to hear about how yeah, you guys got the yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so well, first, we, we've been partners with uh, Winston Biases for a long time and really, really excited to have uh, 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 that partnership. And yeah, please uh, uh, feel free to uh, listen to that. But yeah, we, we announced uh, this week that uh, on Llama 3.8b, on Llama 3.8b, which you know most people, me, most people are now pretty familiar with, with Meta's model, we are able to generate 1,000 tokens uh, per second in inferencing on, on full precision. 16-bit full precision. And that's important because if you look at some of the types of tasks that you want to do, especially if you want to do math and some of the more 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 broader range of tasks on those models, the the that the the lower quantization, like the 8-bit quantization, is just starts hallucinating really bad. You get the wrong answer. And so for our customers, our customers really care a lot about the quality and the result of the model. Running fast is really important, but then getting the right answers uh, more important. And so we focus very much on full precision and making sure that our results are of the highest accuracy possible. And Meta spent uh, $100 million or $200 million training these models in full precision. And so we don't want to then give away that precision just to run a little bit faster. And so we focused on running them full precision at a thousand. It's it's actually, I think we we, we just touched 1100 tokens per second, but people can try it on fast.snova.ai. They can try it, but on only 16 sockets, just 16 chips. Right, and this is important because I always tell people that at scale, when you start running these with hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of models with thousands and thousands of people at scale, you just cannot afford to keep buying more chips. 
You just can't do it. And every chip that you deploy, there's all sorts of networking and storage and other power that comes along with it. And all of that cost gets passed on to every user. And so we focus on efficiency. And so we're doing this on just 16 chips running a thousand tokens per second. And what's more, more, more important is we can actually host a thousand different checkpoints on the same 16 chips and running them at a thousand tokens per second. That's, and that's uh, ultimately what we think is, is will be the use model that you have a lot of people with different checkpoints that they like, but you have to access them very, very quickly. That's incredible. Could you tell us about the chip specifically? Because you're not running on NVIDIA stuff, right? This is, you call them RDUs. Could you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, no, it's 100% uh, Samanova hardware. And so this is our fourth generation chip. It's called RDU, a reconfigurable data flow unit. And what you're seeing is the power of data flow. If you don't have to fix the LLM and spoon feed it into rigid cores in the way that most of the chip architectures are, what you can do is you can actually let the data flow through the machine and have the neural net be staged so the output of one kernel goes into the output input of the next kernel without having all of this handshake that you're doing with, with GPUs. And this is ultimately where, where, where I think you're gonna see the world go, that the efficiencies are not 10 to 20%. You're seeing efficiencies of four, five, 10X if you can just minimize the amount of memory access that you have to do off chip and keep as much of it on chip and then minimize the number of sockets that you have to interconnect and talk to each other and keep it all within the same number of the same small cluster of chips. And so with just uh, 16 chips, we can keep all the data local, all the data doesn't have to leave the rack. And so a lot of the inefficiency that you're seeing today with this uh, GPU sprawl is because so much of your energy is actually handshaking between one DGX to another, to another, to another, mm. and we can keep it all resident and if it's all resident, not only do you get the power efficiency, but you get speed and and you, you speed and latency efficiency. Absolutely. I just want to welcome Anton as well. Anton, that's a product in Sabanova. Welcome to the stage as well. And I do want to ask you guys about this new frontier of like speedy inference as well, because as you broke a thousand tokens per second, kind of the previous place that does incredibly fast inference that we know is Grok, probably a competitor of yours, I'm assuming. And then they did not take this likely and they released like an update that also done like a 20% speed increase. However, there's a precision thing. So maybe Anton can speak to this as well. How how much like a 16 like full 16 bit precision is important to you guys to deliver? Hey, uh, thanks, Alex. Yeah. So we've by the way we've got plenty of room to to keep bumping this up as well. And I think the the really this is going to be really fun <laughs> for 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 whatever period of time it goes on where we're we keep moving the needle forward and Grog keeps moving the needle forward and GPUs stay still because they nobody can get more out of GPU. So I think I think the first thing that this proves is that the GPU architecture is fundamentally flawed. But I, I think I, I think to to the point Rodrigo was making, there's there's lots and lots and lots of evidence that as you quantize and as you quantize carelessly, you're really, really impacting the quality of the model, which defeats the purpose of 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 tra Lama uh, Lama three was overtrained. The in the incremental gains that it got from it didn't justify the cost, but they did it because it's an eight billion model, and they wanted to give a form factor for inference that was really that was more cost effective, and could, people could get could get real value from it. As soon as you quantize, you're 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 doing a disservice to all of that work. And so we just we just believe that we need to maintain the quality of the model, and 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 others are compromising. Our Grox compromised that in in search of more speed. So yeah, we'll see. I think it's going to be it's going to be fun to see the the developments in the weeks and months. I'm I'm rooting for this competition, and I think there was a there's a tweet of mine that I answered to the some of the stuff that you did and said, Grok not going to take this likely. And both the Samba Nova account and the Grok account both liked this tweet. And I was like, okay, here we go. We've previously seen this uh, competition in like the um, diffusion inference providers. They, they're also like, they fought like who's the fastest like stable diffusion as well. Uh, on that kind of topic, maybe Rodrigo or Anton, feel free to answer each one of you. Are, uh, is RDU specifically for LLM kind of inference or are all like tasks that, that we now see from generative AI, including diffusion, including like different other things are also being able to run with the speed yeah no let me chime in real quick since i have to drop off and yes, apologize to, uh, but i know so summon over where uh, an rdu that's the beauty of the R rdu right that the same platform just on the same 16 chips you can train 
you can fine tune, you can inference, you can do language models, you can vision models. If you look at Samba 1, it's a multi-model already today. It's got llama models, it's got some uh, vision models, it's got, it's, it's got a bunch of different things in there. And we expect, and, and you can actually run them concurrently, meaning I can get from a, a language model to a vision model within the milliseconds because they're all cached and you're able to actually reconfigure the hardware to do it. And so we're really proud of that. It, we do think that the world's going to go multimodal, that you're going to run all of these things concurrently because all of us, any given day, we do dozens of tasks and we need all these different types of models to support our productivity, right? And so that's our mission to actually give you a private and secure way of accessing a broad range of models, but at live, live real time, right? So that you can access it without having to wait for models to load and unload and get a thousand tokens and, and by, by then probably thousands of tokens per second so that you can actually get productivity at a level that matches the, 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 the real timeness of where you need it. So I'll let Anton comment the next, but really great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm just going to drop off, but thanks for having us and supporting us. And I'll be a fun, fun next, uh, next couple of years, just watching all these uh, different players come up with new innovation. Thank you, Rodrigo, for coming up. And again, folks, right. Rodrigo and, and the CEO of Weights and Biases, Lucas Buwald, had a great discussion on gradient descent. Please listen to this. They talked for over an hour about Sambanova, about some of these things. Probably not about the uh, thousand tokens per second <laughs> break, because this is new. Rodrigo, thank you so much for coming up. Anton, just a follow up. Nisten, you wanted uh, you. to ask a question as well? Yeah, so uh, I'm trying it out. And it, it's true. It, it does come out at a thousand per second. And, and the prompt processing is at, at 9,000 uh, a, a second. Uh, are there any limitations to to the platform itself? Like, for example, I, I pasted in just exactly 4,200 tokens, and then it said the, the, the input is, is too long. So it, is that what the, the limitation is, is right now for, for this model size, or can you guys scale that up based on yeah. the, the amount of compute? No, no, we don't even need more compute. Honestly, we'll resolve that in the coming, in the, and hopefully in the next week or so. We just we we push this out as quickly as we did, and we take we take some shortcuts to do it candidly. But there's no fundamental challenges. The, the great thing we've got this like three tier memory hierarchy. We've got huge, huge DDR, but the DDR is directly connected to the chip, so it's super fast. It's up to 12 terabytes on a well, 24 terabytes on a, on a 16 socket node. And then we've got we've got HBM, and then we've got really really large and really fast and distributed SRAM on chip, which sort of is what what enables data flow. Re really large contacts lengths are actually a sweet spot for us. We're we're going to be spending a lot of time in the next weeks and months doing a lot of really cool stuff on on handling really really large contacts lengths uh, without any performance degradation. So same tokens per second, lower lower time to first token, higher sequence length. Amazing. Anton, a follow-up question on this, because we, we've been talking, we will talk soon about the different architectures. We've been talking about different architectures that are not transformer-based, like SSM and Mamba, etc. Is, is is that something uh, on your guys' radar as well, specifically around the kind of the very long context execution as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, so interestingly, a lot of that work comes from Chris Ray, our co-founder's lab at Stanford. Who knows what happens when, but but I think attention will change or be replaced at some point in time. These state space models are an example of that. We are going to benefit a lot from that because they, those architectures are really, really, really good for us. They have a way to go, obviously. They they aren't yet at the quality of the of of the the traditional attention models, but but I think there's so much innovation, and whenever whenever it gets to that point where 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 these models are super super mm. competitive. I think we'll run them faster than anybody else. Amazing. And uh, so I, I guess a last follow-up question before we move on. And again, thank you for coming and, and following up with Rodrigo as well. What about some other models? I know the Llama 3, 7, or 8B, I guess, this is kind of the, the, the fastest model inference now in the world. You guys broke, like you said, 1,100, and then in with, with not full precision, Grok breaks 1,200. You guys are waste, You guys have a ways to go, and we'll see some stuff from you. And I'm excited to see like how fast this can go. What are some other models that we are expected to kind of see maybe you support? And is an API coming? Is it the consumer API? Are you only focused on enterprise? Could you like tackle some of these points? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All of the models we already run lots of them. We just don't really expose them as 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 this API. And I think the the, the difference for us right now is we're we're not trying to do what Grok are doing. In that Grok made 
an explicit decision that they are going to be a cloud and, and they're going to build their own chips, expose their own API, monetize that directly themselves. We have lots and lots and lots of partners and customers who we are going to support in doing that themselves. So from that perspective, we're not planning to, to directly monetize our API today. Like that's, that, that's not where our focus is, is on enabling others to do that. So we have all of these models already up and running. We're going to continue to do lots of really, really exciting, pushing the, pushing the needle of performance on like 70B, for instance, Llama 70B, all of the all of the state space stuff we're we're making lots of investments in MOEs we're making lots of investments in. It's just we we're a relatively small company. Um, we're around 500 people, but 500 people doing all of these things is 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 a lot. It's a lot of stuff. So we just need to be focused and tackle things as they come. And Llama the Llama models, Llama three models right now are the most impactful, I think, to the community. But everything's every we support all of the other models. We haven't optimized them to the same degree. Thanks for that. I think one of the things that I'm excited about about like this, like you guys and, and Grok stuff, specifically the models that don't run sorry, the, the hardware that doesn't do just GPUs, is the upcoming releases. We all know that Llama three four hundred billion is training. And for the open source community, people are like, oh, how can we even like fine tune this? We will need like a lot of GPUs itself. And then other people People are like, okay, I won't be even able to run this. But to me, it's very exciting that a model of that size would be able to benefit significantly from this inference speed that you guys are offering. And then we'll see like a, a potentially way cheaper like GPU four level model come and and get actually like super fast entrance. Not to mention that I think that the new user experience like things that are getting opened when there's almost real time like thousand tokens a second is just incredibly fast. I think we got we get excited when we saw five hundred tokens per second, but now we're, we're seeing this like super optimized, and we do hope that you guys keep fighting each other and we'll yeah, see yeah. like bigger and faster executions. Please post, and we'll 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 be watching this competition very. Very, very happily. And there anything else you want to chime in on before we move on to, to the next thing? Do you want to mention yeah. or a shout out? No, no, no. Th- thanks so much for for having Rodrigo and I. I, I think we we want to we want to engage as much as possible with the community. So feel free to reach out and ask questions. Or I think we 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 try to be as transparent as possible about all of this stuff. So um, yeah, thanks so much. And I I will shout out that when I reached out, somebody actually gave me an API key to test and. It, it, it's ridiculously fast. It's like unbelievably fast to the point of what's the point of streaming tokens at this point? There's no point. Like things just like poof and appear and it's quite incredible. And we do expect like bigger models and hopefully if folks are in enterprise and that's what they want to do, feel free to reach out to the folks at Sambanova and I think we'll move on to the next thing. Thank you, Anton, for being here. Thank you, Rodrigo, for hopping in and folks who frantically coordinated this in the audience from Sambanova as well. I see you. Thanks, Virginia and some of the folks. I love having the folks who make the news on stage here. As we move to the next thing, and I think we have some breaking news from Anthropic, actually. Let's do some breaking news. AI breaking news coming at you only on Thursday I. So the breaking news from Anthropic that we just got is that tool use, the ability of the model to call your functions as you define them is now generally available. So if you use Claude, Opus, or Haiku, or Sonnet, do you guys remember Sonnet, the middle child? If you use any of those, you now can use their like new function calling slash tool use abilities in, in Claude and it's generally available. And I think they mentioned something else. It can orchestrate like a few a few tools as well and com- solving complex tasks, agentic tasks as well. And I think it's pretty cool that they, they have this. Everybody should have tool use on their platforms and Anthropic finally released theirs in, in full node. And shout out to Anthropic. Another thing for Anthropic, like briefly, we don't, we don't talk about all the drama, but there is drama happening in the AI world. And we just don't have time, right? We're almost like an hour and a half. We still haven't covered like multiple things. But there's a whole thing where Jan Lenke left OpenAI. Jan had spearheaded the super intelligence team together with uh, Ilya Satskover. And Jan Lenke left OpenAI fairly surprisingly a couple of weeks ago. And Jan just announced that he joined Anthropic recently to work probably on the super alignment stuff. Last week, if you guys remember, we talked about scaling mono semanticity. The paper that Anthropic released, and one one thing over the weekend that maybe you guys haven't seen, but please tell me that you have seen. If you haven't seen, I'll post some uh, examples of this in the show notes, is that 
the paper that we did talk about on Thursday called Monosemanticity talked about features that they found uh, in the Claude Sonnet model, the kind of the fairly big production model called Sonnet, features are groups of neuron activations in this neural weights thing that together define something. That something could be a proper noun, or it could be like a person, or it could be a trait. Some of the traits they talked about is deceiving, or racial bias, and all these things, and their ability to what's called clamp these features, either make them significantly more prominent in the model's brain, or significantly less prominent. So an example they saw is they found a feature that's called bad code, and when they they reduced the prominence of this feature, the model actually outputted better code. But also one of the examples they showed is racial bias feature where they upped it to the max and it's spoken like somebody from like the, the, the deep south, the very racial, whatever, somebody who's like super racist. And then the model actually reflected upon the stuff that it said and felt that like it shouldn't have been saying this. So that's very, very interesting. They did an experiment. Tropic did an experiment. They actually upped, they found a feature for call, called Golden Gate Bridge. And that's how Golden Gate Cloud was born. And they actually deployed this model on production. And for a few days over the weekend, you and I and everybody else on Cloud.ai, we could have talked to Golden Gate Cloud. This is a version of Cloud. I'm assuming Claude's on it, that no, no matter what you asked it, it would try to like show you facts and talk about Golden Gate Bridge. And it's it's quite something. Now, it's really funny because uh, folks were saying like, hey, you can do this with prompt engineering, etc. And to some extent you can, but just the amount of incredible stuff that came out of Golden Gate Cloud was just like incredible. So I, I remember asking it to bake a cake or give me instructions of baking a cake. And it's Back and forth started talking about, hey, I shouldn't talk about the bridge. I'm talking about cake. And uh, like it started saying, we need to combine eggs and, and uh, flour together. And how do we combine eggs and flour where eggs will start on one end of the bridge and uh, flour starts on the other end of the bridge. And while you're baking the cake, you can, you know, bask at the, the beautiful foggy of, of uh, foggy landscape of the Golden Gate Bridge. It was quite something. So the example of Golden Gate Bridge are very like entertaining as well. This has nothing to do with breaking news. I just wanted to make sure that Golden Gate Bridge is mentioned here because RIP, we've, we, we, we will miss you. No, it is something that can also be applied to other models. We were doing something similar with trying to find exactly which layer it starts to to censor itself in, and yeah, there, there's there's a lot more to be done in in this in this field. It also like matters where where you put it as well. Yeah. I think the next thing that I want to talk about in the big companies. So again, we, we just talked about Samba Nova breaking a thousand tokens per second. We mentioned the Grok, Grok hits back with 1200 tokens per second. Those speeds are ridiculous. However, like I want to, I want to move on and talk about scale. Scale AI introduced a new leaderboard benchmark for us. As, as you guys get ready to be familiar with SEAL leaderboard, uh, Scaler is the SEAL leaderboards. Those are the expert leaderboards that experts kind of like build in the evaluations. If you guys remember previously, we've talked about GSM 1K. GSM 8K is grade school. I think it's grade school math examples and all these models are run on uh, GSM 8K. And there's a whole thing about many of these models actually like over over trained and some of this some of these evaluation benchmarks already leaked into these these models so it's really hard to judge whether the model is like well performing or it just was trained on some of these benchmarks and so for that reason scale released something called GSM 1K and when I say release, they didn't actually release this. They announced that they have built a GSM 1K, like a, a fully new, never seen by the models before uh, benchmark uh, that's very similar uh, to GSM 8K, uh, only with 1,000 examples. And when they announced it, we back then, we talked about how it's very important maybe to have also some sort of these benchmarks because there's like only a few ways to gauge quality of models there's obviously the open benchmarks like gsm 8k and the eval grande and uh, human eval like all of these things that we are all um, mmlu uh, mmmu like all of these things to, to that we report on and then we know the problems with them we know the problems that sometimes the folks train on these benchmarks because they're in the open source and this you you like saying that they're like actually like a good training data set as well but but there's all these problems and so then we have the lmc arena lmc is like the the elo score that actually humans judge models against each other and they come up with the elo score lmc arena also has problems right like we we like to over focus on lmc's because like it's a good source lmc arena has problems because 
the folks who know about LMCs are folks who are like us, who are excited about AI and get, getting excited about the new release. So some of them, if you guys remember the I'm good GPT-2 chatbot, or I'm also a good GPT-2 chatbot, we got excited about finding that one in the arena. So we probably weren't giving the best score. So it, they're also like... Um, non-representative and very selective and there's also then the next thing and i think wolfram wolfram here from participant in the reddit like local llama subreddit in the comments i think you got called out specifically by under karpati or like some folks that there's like folks like wolfram here that in the subreddits use these models and report methodically there's folks like who have like the, the methodic ways and then we're missing a new category and this new category is this new arena called scale sorry called seal from from company scale which they built their evaluations and did not put them publicly and the only way a model appears on that leaderboard is when they see that evaluation run for the first time and i think that's uh, super cool so we're going to talk about this i just want to welcome also eric hartford to the stage eric you've been here maybe once before but we've been talking about dolphin stuff and and your stuff for a while so feel free to unmute and and say you know introduce yourself to the audience for the first time and also feel free to chime in on the uh, benchmarking kind of debate and the scale stuff Hi, I'm Eric Hartford, and I write the I make the Dolphin and Samantha models with my crew, Cognitive Computations. And I one of the questions I have is about the ELO, because what I see the the problem is I see on the ELO scores, the LMSYS scores, is I see some of these ancient models like Vicuña that really are terrible, and yet they score highly on the ELO score. And, and I want to understand, but you know why that is. And maybe if they're doing anything about it, I, I don't know. I'm confused by that. I am also confused. And I don't know if uh, I know. Yam or Nisten, do you have any idea, Wolfram, uh, why would Vicuña score so high, given that it's two years old at this point? Year old? I, I don't remember. I think it's like... Uh, very it's been a year and a half. Yeah, it's been a year and a half. Yeah, no idea, Eric. I, I also like, but but I think that the whole ELO score is like very interesting. Specifically, let's let's compare kind of the scores. GPT four O came out, and everybody was like super excited about this, and they showed a huge jump, like a hundred point jump in ELO score for GPT four O above GPT four Turbo, and. Assumingly, LMCs has statistically enough kind of samples from people playing around with these models, and then they showed like a huge jump. OpenAI came out and like actually quoted that result in the release of GPT-40, and obviously they've been like playing with LMCs and giving us like these like secret names, like I'm too, I'm G a good chat GPT-2 or GPT-2, and then that score went down from 100 points difference in ELO to 50 points difference in ELO. And now that scale released their arena or their like uh, levels, you can see that GPT-40 is actually not better than the Turbo Preview, which is what many people were saying, specifically for code. And so I, I also got to gotta applaud that scale came out with this new method of testing. And so we have another way of, of like evaluating this, not only on vibes and not only on excitement, because I do feel that excitement is playing a big part of it. And like people trying to find the GPT-40 like excitement in, in the arena. I don't actually think that arena has nefarious purposes and they like paying, getting paid to promote models. I don't think that that's the case, even though I did hear this is Twitter after all, we hear all kinds of takes, but I do, I do think that it's very important that we have have and yet another way to measure these things so again let me just run through them local llama and vibes and folks like wolfram doing great jobs and like very systematically trying to assess models but then also like many people doing like different fine tunes very important then we have lmc serena which is the elo score which is the ranking between people seeing two models and saying this output is better that output is better we have obviously the open source benchmarks and the open llm leaderboards that we have and uh, like uh, mmlu and like different things like this and now we also have scale which their approach is hey we're like a trusted source and we don't tell anyone about our benchmarks and we uh, we only put the model the first time that company saw our benchmarks because you could make the claim that if scale runs a bunch of benchmarks the company can see it in the api and start training about on it so they're saying the model will only be put on the leaderboard the first time that model saw our benchmarks in the in the prompts and i think the vibes as well so vibes from the thursday community as we test these models and Nistin will have a bunch of stuff to say about gemini flash i'm sure once we get there so i think it's a very uh, commendable effort from from scale and we'll be mentioning the seal leaderboards coming uh, uh, going forward as we mentioned lmc's as well 
And Eric, I know this didn't answer your question at all. I'm, I'm just like very happy that we have other other ways to measure like the the top frontier models. On that, uh, anything about scale, uh, Wolfram? I want to hear from you because I, I know that like how important you treat your evaluations. What do you think about this whole approach of like private leaderboards? Because you don't you don't expose your stuff as well, right? You, you're like you're keeping your stuff private. That's right. Because once you put it online, everybody will train on it in, in never inevitably eventually so i didn't do that and i i understand why they are doing that and i appreciate it because every data point counts and you can't have enough evaluations i think the more the better so we can i don't i don't think there is a perfect evaluation everything has a difference or a, a disadvantage so even they they are, as far as I know, they are selling data packs to their customers and their customers are the people they are testing. So I understand uh, that I have seen the same with my own tests when I test a model from somebody I respect, like Eric, for example. And uh, there was a model, uh, the Dolphin version, which I tested and I was hesitant because I thought, oh man, a lot of people say it's great and this one, it didn't work for me. So I told Eric and he told me he realized the same at that point time yeah so it's the same could happen there that is always a problem if you have if you know the people you are testing and it's not blind of course nothing is perfect but every time you have an evaluation it is a point where others can see and decide which model to test because in the end everybody has their own unique use cases so we all want the best model but usually there is not the best model but uh, you always have to decide is it speed is it local is it the language you are speaking? The best model is always a, a different one for individual people. So we need a lot of benchmarks to see which model is good for what and then decide which one we want to use. And that's why I think it's great. The more we have, the more information there is, the better we can be informed and pick the right models. Yeah, and I think like reading through the vibes, but also through some of these now new leaderboards, I think it gives us like a very good idea. And it looks like right now the GPT-4 for O and for Turbo still at the top for like many, many things, including coding. And I think we're moving on to the next thing, unless we want to talk about some evils a little bit more, but I, feel free to raise your hand. But I think we're, we're, this is also the kind of the leaderboard related thing. Since Gemini and Gemini Flash released this week, LMCs released an update that finally the Gemini kind of 514, so 14th of May, a couple of weeks ago, these models, 14th of May was Google I.O., I think those, these models got released. So the, the new API and the Flash, Gemini 1.5 Pro and 1.5 Flash, they also have something called Advanced, which I have no idea what this is. These models now top the LMC Serena, but they don't necessarily top the 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 code, like the, the scale arena. So it's going to be very interesting to find a way to tell you guys about which models are the best. But the thing that I wanted to highlight specifically is Gemini 1.5 flash and i think that this model is the most underrated release from google io by far i think the open ai did an amazing pr stunt when they released the gpt 40 like a, a voice thing a day before G uh, google io and then Ilya quit like a day after whatever there's a whole thing to not <laughs> to clamp down on the google io kind of release but i think that and and that's why maybe people Maybe people ignored or maybe haven't seen the Gemini Flash as it is, but I will just want to talk about Gemini Flash because I think it's an incredible model. On coding at the SEAL uh, scales uh, leaderboard, SEAL leaderboard, we need to get into the uh, use case of saying SEAL leaderboard, SEAL leaderboards. Gemini Flash gets fifth place, fifth place. So like the, the one, two, three, four, five is four Turbo, four O, Gemini 1.5 Pro, Cloud Opus, and then coding Gemini 1.5 flash preview which gets like a, a whopping like a, like score of 1057 on LMC Serena it gets the ninth place overall in the overall category and here's the thing about Gemini flash it has 1 million context window as we've learned to love and expect from from Gemini but also it's ridiculously fast it's way faster in throughput so you can actually see it's not okay let's be let's let's talk about ridiculously fast Samba Nova AI releasing a thousand tokens per second for Llama. That's ridiculously fast, right? I don't think it runs at a thousand tokens per second. I actually didn't see any tokens per second metrics for Gemini Flash. If you have them, by the way, please put them in the comments. If you know how fast Gemini Flash actually runs, uh, like numbers wise, uh, tokens per second wise, I would love to know because I don't have a, a, a metric on that. But it runs really fast. You can just see it. Time to first byte is something that, yeah, Eric, go ahead. Do you, do you know how fast it runs? 
I don't know about how fast, but I just wanted to comment that I've been building this new data set called System Chat 2.0. Mm. And during the course of this, I've experimented with Gemini 1.5 Pro and a little bit with the Flash. And what I found that's particularly interesting is it's way better at creative writing and, and colorful writing than uh, GPT-4 or GPT-4 Turbo or or GPT-4.0. If you are trying to generate any kind of fictional content or or colorful narrative type content, give Gemini a try because it's really superb. Yeah, and, and now we're getting confirmations of multiple things like LMCs, but also now the CL leaderboards that Flash specifically. The, the reason why I'm getting so excited is because not only the context window is large, it's a multimodal model, right? Like all of the top models are now multimodal, but also the context length is ridiculous. The price point is is a little bit problematic because they raise prices because people just notice them. I think artificial guy is is uh, getting super viral. A friend of the pod who noticed that they raised the price point, and still with the raised price point, Gemini uh, one point five Flash is I think ten times cheaper than the next five models above it. Ten times cheaper. Uh, I think uh, the input tokens is three. It, 35 cents for the first 128 tokens and the output tokens is um, one dollar per millions of tokens on the output and we all know that these models don't usually output millions of tokens um, so you can you can effectively use its context window with a lot of context with examples you can shove like a bunch of examples in there it will still be super fast and and you will not pay that much i think that's very important because previously i had the same thing to say about haiku if you guys remember, Claude Haiku was like very like fairly priced as well. This like Gemini Flash beats Haiku by a long shot. It beats Sonnet. It beats Haiku's bigger brother. It beats uh, Lama 370B Instruct at a price point that's like very 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 impressive. So uh, now we have confirmation from uh, b both like the 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 seal leaderboards and the flash sorry the LMCS leaderboards that this is a very good model confirming that what we've seen around Nistan. Not your vibe check for Flash. I saw that you're not like super impressed by it. Uh, it's good for one shot. I, I I tried to use it as a as a continuous assistant, and it just wasn't wasn't good for that mm. that particular use. But overall, it, yeah, it it would give pretty great answers fast. So uh, I, again, if you're gonna run a whole bunch of API calls, you you want to dump stuff in all at once, then it's good. But if you want long output from it, I I wasn't getting that much luck. And even for stuff like making making summaries of of long conversations, the the style of the writing was was not that good. But for for code and and regular use, it, it was okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Overall, I, I am not too too imp impressed. But I, I haven't used it on, <laughs> on a production application though, so that's I, I don't know in, in that regard. Wolfram, what's your what's your take on the flash? I haven't used it, but I have seen a lot of people talk about it like that, so it should be good. It's on my list. One of the next models I'm going to test will be Flash. All right, folks, give Wolfram a follow, and, and uh, Flash is definitely... The way that I see it, and I think I, I've, I've gotten super excited about caching as well, and we've talked about caching that uh, Google supports now LLM calls caching specifically for a long context. I actually don't know the Flash is... Let me go see. Google Flash, Google Gemini 1.5. I don't know if Flash is actually uh, supported for 1.5, uh, but the, the 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 sorry the caching thing. Cache is like very very important for long context and will significantly save money. So the way to save money on OpenAI is to do the batching inference thing. We've talked about this before, where you don't get immediate answers; you get answer within 24 hours. So like for evaluations, for example, that's a good use case for running like a bunch of evals. For Gemini, that's going to be caching, and I think caching is going to be like significantly bigger in the moat that Google gives on their platforms. And yeah, obviously the longer context window is a moat that only Google can give us. One thing that I did post, I posted a, a tweet from Logan Kilpatrick, who's now the, the Gemini product for Gemini Google AI Studio, is that the it was from today. They're now both in general availability, Flash and Pro, and Flash has now a thousand requests per minute limit, which is on its own something that not many people can do or get from even OpenAI. I think the whole big thing with OpenAI that people loved using these models and then uh, they didn't get nearly the same like request per minute. Oh, and they announced tuning as well. Oh, right. so we have breaking news from Google. Flash is now announced that you can fine tune Flash, which is amazing. 
And we should work with Google to have that inside Blitz and Biases. Folks, I think it's time to move on to the next thing. And we have another another person who helped to, to, to give you breaking news this week. And I want to talk about voice and audio. I don't have a transition, so I'll just I'll just play some music to the transition. So the next category that we're going to talk about is voice and audio. And we don't usually have that much to say in the voice and audio category. However, this week we have like very, 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 very exciting news. And I'm very honored to have Arjun here. Arjun, feel free to unmute and say hi to the folks and give us your background and who you are, because this is your first time on the pod. And then we're going to talk about Cartesia. Awesome. No, appreciate it, Alex. Uh, thanks for having us on. So yeah, I'm Arjun. I'm a co-founder here at Cartesia. And so we built Cartesia just a few months ago, really to focus on this idea of how do we bring, bring real-time intelligence to all devices for all users. So here, thinking not just about quality, but also about efficiency in terms of performance and speed of the compute, also in terms of how fast you can make sure that you get the responses back, making sure that you're compute efficient and things like that as well. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit about me and, and the company. How I just want to let me see if I can if I can do this one second. I I want to talk about Cartesia, but I also wanted to try and see if I can use Cartesia to actually welcome you. Let's see. Welcome, Arjun. Congrats on releasing Cartesia.ai. So this is one of my favorite voices from Cartesia. Is a 1920s radio man. I actually opened the space with it, and I want to talk about the highlight of why this is like very exciting for folks which is speed. I literally press this button and your UI shows me that it was generated in 153 milliseconds. There's a whole thing about Google releasing a long time ago some, some, some research about user experience and how everything under 200 milliseconds we humans perceive as almost immediate. And obviously for the past few weeks we've been like very enthralled with GPT-4O's conversational abilities which are like almost immediate and people are like thinking, okay, waiting for some voice to get generated is one thing, but we need immediacy. How the hell are you getting 153 milliseconds to generate this voice? Tell me. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. A lot of the work that we're doing here at Cartesia is built off some of the research that our co-founders did. Uh, Albert Gu and Kern Goyle um, did during their PhD at Stanford, uh, which is really focusing on uh, efficient architectures. Uh, so a lot of times right now, a lot of the ML world is focused on transformers and attention. Uh, they really spent time on focusing on how you can build these next generation of sub-quadratic models, specifically state-space models that allow you to get a lot of the efficiency benefits that transformers don't get when you have no longer context or being able to run faster on slower devices, older GPUs, or maybe on device, things like that as well. So that's the core of our technology. And then it's, it's more than just the modeling, right? Making sure that the whole engineering stack is optimized for that as well. But because of that modeling component, we can really drive these speeds substantially down, right? You heard that a model generated at the time to first audio was within a hundred and 70 milliseconds and we see around 150 to 160 milliseconds on average lowest being 100 or 110 milliseconds we're, we're really excited to still keep pushing this forward and i think there's a lot of unique architectural and just general ml advances that we're making to really make this happen that's yeah, yeah, so I'm I'm very excited about this like state space model thing specifically for audio because until kind of you guys released and there was a conversation about this. We've talked about SSMs here on Thursday I multiple times. We've talked about Mamba architecture as well. The we didn't mention that one of the the chief scientists for you like is is Albert Albert and worked with Redow on the SSM kind of architecture. Is that correct? Am I connecting the right pieces? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, amazing. And so we did mention like these, these architectures. We also talked about, we talked with the, the AI21 team about Jamba and their like mutual architecture. Could you tell us a little bit like how and why this works for voice and like why would it better for voice? I guess I saw something about like longer context possible or continuous streams are possible specifically and playing into this architecture kind of strength. Could you talk about this? Definitely, definitely, yes. I think one of the, maybe a little bit about the history of SSMs, Albert definitely would be the, the best person to talk about this, but I'll, I'll try to do my best here. I, I think high level, the idea is instead of trying to compare every element of the input to every other element in the input, like you maintain the state or some kind of memory of what you've seen so far. And something that's very unique about audio or generally signals that you might experience in the real world is that they're often very compressible. You can put them into a small amount of information and still be able to get good outputs from it. And usually what we've seen in the past is that a lot of text models, 
or for a lot of text applications, things like SSMs have fallen short, but Albert and Tree showed with the, the Mamba architecture is that you can get the benefits of SSMs and, and really push the needle forward on a lot of these applications where you're dealing with text and other modalities and just pure signals. A lot of the work that we we've did, or we, we did, we did when building Sonic, which is our fast text-to-speech model that you just heard, is really thinking about how do we hybridize these different pieces of the SSM world for different modalities and actually make it run super fast. Combine this idea of having a fixed state where you can generate from you know, in constant time so that the generation is fast, make sure that different components like processing the prompt is also very fast. And when you engineer these different things well and have the fundamental reasons or the theory behind it that actually backs up why we can do those things, it makes like the process a lot more seamless. Audio, I think, is one of these applications which often a lot of folks don't really look into, but it really allows us to show, and it's very visceral, right? If someone isn't talking or things are buffering for a long period of time, it's really hard to appreciate the experience. But with audio and things like SSMs, you can actually build these experiences in a much more seamless way uh, for users in the future. I I completely get this, and I, I think it's like uh, remarkable, right? So like we've seen, you know, some of your competitors, Eleven Labs, people know. You guys also offer voice cloning, which is something like the, the bigger companies are like uh, hesitant to do. We we obviously saw from OpenAI the the voice engine that they have. They didn't release publicly because they're afraid. Could you? I, I don't want to put you in the hot seat, so you feel free to skip this next question. But could you comment maybe about the voice cloning aspect of this? I just b before we get to like your answer, I'll just tell you where I am sitting in. I'm not a journalist. I'm not trying to trick you. I do believe the voice cloning tech as, 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 as open as possible will get us like faster to the point where people will understand that everything can be cloned. Their five seconds from their phone messages can be cloned. People need to know about this so they start like trusting like voice less. However, there's, there are some implications of releasing a voice cloning technology. Could you mention kind of how, how you guys think about this in, in this kind of like election year and stuff? Definitely, definitely. No, I think that's a very important point, something we're very actively thinking about. I think when we think about generally putting these models in, into the public, we also want to make sure that we're barring misuse and, and things like that as well. In specific for voice cloning, if we're thinking about what it actually can enable, it's great that the technology is there where we are able to clone voices really well, but also creating ways of being able to detect if certain audio is generated, making sure that we have practices and gating for users who are attempting to misuse the technology. These are all very important and things that are pretty top of mind as we're continuing the release. Yeah, all right. And uh, so one of the things that I noticed, especially like uh, super cool voices as well, very, very fast. I tried to build with it and yesterday, and you guys hopped in <laughs> on the Zoom to try to help me out because I got stuck. So I really, really appreciated this. The the fact that you guys were in the office on the release day very shows how much uh, you guys are shipping. What else should folks know about Cartesia? And kind of like, if you want to do any shout outs to the team as well, feel free, the stage is yours. Can we expect some more, more stuff from you coming soon? Are you focusing on supporting? Can folks use this right now? Now, tell us everything that folks may need to know and hear about uh, Cartesia. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, Sonic was our first release as a company. And I really just want to give a shout out to the whole team. They did an amazing job making this, delivering it uh, to the public and having people be able to use it. It's been incredibly fun to see what people are building. But we, of course, aren't, aren't stopping here. There's a lot of exciting things to do next. Intelligence is much broader than just audio or text, right? There's a level of understanding your surroundings and being able to learn from experiences that are very different than just putting in text and getting some output out. So I think there's a lot of exciting stuff to build when we're trying to build towards this direction. And something that I think I, I really want folks to pay attention to is that having an API is not necessarily, you know, orthogonal to building in the open source, right? So a lot of us, our background is researchers. We love, you know, doing things in the open source and we really are excited to engage with the community and push on more open source efforts as well. So if folks are interested in that, want to get involved, want to try more things out, feel free to drop us a line. We'd love to hear what you guys are building and we'd love to build this out together. That's awesome. And uh, I, I don't know, you, you joined the space in the middle, but we talked about open source for the first 
one hour we have like uh, world's finest fine tuners join the stage here uh we would love to see releases like this there's not a lot of releases in the audio space we've talked about xtts and we've talked about some of the other like efforts in the space uh we would love to see some some stuff from you as well and it's great to hear that you guys are uh, believing in open source as well it's super super cool arjun thank you so much for joining folks should definitely check out cartesia especially if you're playing with voices maybe one last thing that i want to hear from you is some on device stuff because we didn't talk about this but one of the best things is like running things on device could you could you speak about like that aspect a little bit of, of sonic or like the upcoming models i think um uh, it, we're really excited about the on device world a lot of ai in the future it's always great to have like, great large chips i know you had some folks from Salmonova on they've been doing some great work on pushing some of the boundaries there but i think when you're thinking about a lot of applications that deal with privacy or general information control, like having on-device, on-prem applications is pretty critical. This is definitely something we're interested in looking into. And I think SSMs are best geared for this, right? They give you better memory footprints, so you're not using as much compute for low memory devices like your phones, maybe older computers, things like that. These kinds of things matter a lot. And of course, speed is critical, right? Network speed is something you can get rid of by bringing stuff on-device. That's of course very important, but you still need to run things fast. And SSMs really give you this power and so we're really excited to keep building that space and see see what we come up with and folks come up with in the future. Awesome. We will be monitoring SSMs in now in audio as well as, as we've seen them in, in other Transformer alternative architectures. Thanks to Arjun for joining. Folks uh, should check out Cartesia and give Arjun a follow as well. So we'll hear maybe some more exciting news from you guys. Uh, and congrats on the release. Looks super, super cool. And I play with it. I'm very, very very impressed with the speed i really want to build now and you know after i finish editing all of this i'll start building and hopefully build some cool things as well thank you for joining arjun and i think we're moving on to the next thing and okay. folks yeah go ahead sorry you want to f finish up oh no love it no thanks for having us oh, awesome thank you arjun and a shout out to the team for the release uh, all right folks next up and not next up i'm actually going back to something because folks in the comments were always like i, I got like, five tags of people telling me hey you skipped like this super quick there is breaking news, as, as we had from Logan Kilpatrick, the, our friends at, at, at Gemini. So let's do the breaking news thing. AI breaking news coming at you only on Thursday. I, I know I hit this button before, but you guys know that I love hitting this button, especially as like things of importance are happening. People told me in the comments I skipped about the most important part. So not only Gemini 1.5 and Pro are in Google, like in general availability, and not only they have like Flash has a thousand requests per minute, they announced fine tuning and, and they announced fine tuning in this like ridiculous way where it's not going to cost you anything. Fine tuning that's free, and the, the, the usage of the fine-tuned model is also free. What the hell? This is, I, I haven't seen this from anybody before, right? Folks commented and said, hey, Alex, did you notice the 2x price increase, blah, 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 blah. I did notice this. And again, I acknowledged it. They released it with, I think, half a, half a, half a dollar for 1 million tokens, and they upped it to a dollar on output tokens. I did notice this, yes, but again, they did this just before the GA and kind of like, you, you know how Google works, it's a huge company. I don't think that people rushed to Flash because of the price before, uh, and at least the input price didn't change. However, however, a big, a huge however, is that fine-tuned models for free and then running inference on them for free is not something that you can see anywhere. It's like, you can fine-tune GPT, I don't think the GPT-4 fine-tuning is still in GA, but you definitely can fine-tune GPT-4 models but then when you do, you pay way more for it because they have to host a specific fine-tuned version of GPT-4 for you. Not to mention that the O version is not fine-tunable as well. Uh, and now we have Google showing their moat. Basically, this is what this is. They're showing their moat. Now, would they add the price afterwards? Potentially. This is a big company and they, they know how to make money. But I think it's very, very worth shouting out that you can now run fine-tunes. And... It's just incredible. Not to mention the, the throughput, which is like crazy, but the, the fine tuning and then running the same token costs for your fine tune model, that's definitely worth a shout out. So shout out to the Google team for, for this release and these breaking news as well. Nistan, I want to hear your, your thoughts about this. We'll, we'll, or Wolfram, will, will you fine tune the Flash model straight after this space ends? <laughs> Huh. I'm, I'm thinking about what does it catch if they're giving it for free. 
what is the product that they are using? So are they training on your data and stuff like that? That's, That's a uh, good I question. That's a good question to probably ask Logan and hopefully he'll answer as well. But yeah, like I actually just said, Google is GPU rich. They can pull it off. And this is platform having you put in their platform. If you're using their fine tune model, you won't be able to switch easily to another model. Folks, we've coming up on more than two hours at this point, and I definitely, definitely would like to start uh, capping up because we've talked about a bunch of stuff. Let me see if I didn't mention anything. Uh, so we talked about, yeah, there's some OpenAI stuff. I don't want to skip this because it's very important. OpenAI added a bunch of stuff for free. So now GPT-4 is for free. Web search, vision, code interpreter, and more are available to free users, including GPTs. So if you remember the GPT store and if you build GPTs before, now they're available to free users as well. That's kind of huge because there's 100 million people use ChatGPT for free versions. They actually sent an email to GPT kind of builders to tell them about this. If you guys remember, they're promising a GPT kind of kickbacks or whatever. GPT builders will get some money. That wasn't announced. Even the top ones, if you guys remember, a friend of the pod, Pietro Schirano recently, uh, they got invited the, the the top GPT builders, the most important, like the most uh, uh, valuable GPTs, they got invited to see the GPT-4 release, but this was like the main benefit. I don't think the folks uh, got it. There's no financial upside at building at the GPT marketplace. They didn't figure this out. Uh, OpenAI also was in the news of uh, announcing a bunch of partnerships with a bunch of news organizations. Folks are getting fairly frustrated because they, they set a notification on the OpenAI account to see what new model gets released. And they, they get OpenAI announced a partnership with Vox. OpenAI announced partnership with this news corp. Blah, 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 blah. One rumor that we must talk about, and I think it's not a rumor anymore, that Apple is rumored to announce OpenAI partnerships. And that there's also even talks about Satya getting worried and talking with Sam Altman about how can this affect Microsoft and whether or not Microsoft's cloud can support this partnership with Apple because Apple has multiple billions of users across their devices who are going to hammer this AI. So very incredible to see how this will work out and whether or not it's going to be part of Siri or not. Very interesting to see. One last thing that I didn't cover, I promise I will cover it, Muzzy, Muzzy in the audience. Poison Bias is sponsored a hackathon with Mistral this weekend in Paris, in Station F. And shout out to Cerebral Valley and shout out to all the all the users and the, the persons who, who got the prize. We had the Lego set, this like a typer Lego set. It looks super cool and I really want to shout out like the folks who... who took out of their time to go and actually participate and build things with Mistral and weights and biases. So like a huge, huge uh, effort as well. Uh, Mazi, I see you in the audience. I will put your link uh, to the to the winning thing to on the space, on the top of the space. Thank you for, for participating as well. I think that's all the news. Oh, no, I have another thing. Upcoming workshop that I'm running with weights and biases to talk to you about evals, to building your own eval framework using Weave. It's coming on June 12th, and I'll add this to the show notes as well. If you're interested in zero to one building evals for yourself and you never build them, please feel free to join. Other folks here who are testing models are more than welcome to join as well and give me feedback. This will be the first time I'm running like a workshop that's like a virtual and would love, would love, would love some feedback as well. I think that's everything that we've covered on Thursday. I, let me do a recap and I'll let you go to your day. I'm going to start editing because the space is not recorded. And so folks who, who tuned in in the middle, they would like to hear this on the podcast. So let me do a recap and then uh, I'll let you go to the rest of your day. Nistan, please go ahead. Since it's not recorded, I want to say I have not paid a single subscription since September. And I've just used random free bots whenever they were available and it's just becoming easier it really looks like the costs of compute are, are going towards zero so yeah don't bother paying for it they'll always put more money in it and it'll just get cheaper just use whatever is free because you you learn the models better too and the, yeah that's all I wanted to say. So it doesn't surprise me that, that Google really offered that anymore. It, it would have surprised me like six months ago, but, but now it's just, yeah, yeah. It, it's becoming ubiquitous kind of. And you can use Flash for free. It's less, you won't be able to use the API, but you can use Flash for free, a Gemini Flash for free. And I think that this is everything that we've covered on Thursday for May 30th. Um, 
Thank you, everybody, for joining. I really want to appreciate everybody who helped us in comments. Thank you so much. I actually looked at comments today and, and got some new news to talk about during the comments as well. So free feel to check out the comments. The space is not recorded, but it's going to your podcast of choice. So if you use Spotify or Apple News or Apple Podcasts, feel free to download this episode even there, even if you don't use it. But if you do use Apple ones, give us a five-star review. That really, really helps folks discover. And I really appreciate everybody here on stage, Wolfram, Niston, Yam was here for a brief period as well. Everybody who else who joined. And I appreciate you, the listener. I see Alexa, I see Kyla, I see Sarah, I see Raul. I see like a bunch of folks, Sean, who return from week to week to learn with us together about everything that happened in AI. I'm super, super excited to bring you this from week to week. So with that, we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining. And hopefully we'll have some more breaking news next week. Cheers, everyone. Mm-hmm.